I feel like we've hit a fair kind of critical mass to get rolling. So, so welcome everyone to this Placer AI webinar, talking about one of our favorite topics, which is malls, and getting to talk about with one of our favorite people, Colin Shaughnessy, EVP at URW. Colin, thank you so much for being here. Hey, Ethan, good to see you, and thanks for having me on today. Appreciate it. And, and, and I, I'll call this out for those of you who are listening, because if you thought Colin was just a smart guy, a handsome devil, he is more than that. We accidentally scheduled our call to start this an hour earlier, and he very <laughs> kindly moved everything around to make this happen anyway. And so, Colin, thank you so much. And uh, so what are we going to talk about today? So first, we're going to give a very, very quick introduction to Placer for those of you who are unfamiliar. Then we are going to get into three sections. The first is going to talk about mall performance. The second is going to look at holiday expectations because we're at the time of year where that is now our most popular question, even though we're still in the height of back to school. And then finally, we're gonna look at a handful of wider questions that obviously have a direct implication to malls. And then finally, we will end with Q&A. Uh, if you have a question at any point throughout the webinar, please plug it in to the Q&A button situated either the top or bottom of, the, of your screen, depending on how you have Zoom configured. This is being recorded. It will be available at the same link by start of day tomorrow. If you want to watch it again, share it. You have a friend who didn't get to see it who you think would find it interesting and all that fun stuff. Introduction to Placer. So uh, Placer is a location analytics firm, but that means very simply people vote with their feet. We're showing you how they vote across the country to retail locations. We do that by observing a panel of over 30 million devices throughout the country. Very critically, this is all anonymized aggregate data. So we are GDPR and CCPA compliant. We then analyze that data with machine learning and AI algorithms to make estimations on visits to retail locations across the country. We then are able to present that data in a wealth of different reports and everything from customer journeys, void analysis, true trade areas, traffic routes, and a whole lot more. If anyone is interested in kind of playing with the tool, we have a free version of our premium product at placer.ai. We also have a wonderful section on our website called The Square, which is the home to our free tools. So if you're interested, please go check those out. But now into the fun stuff, let's talk about malls. So I, I think, you know, you know, we end kind of we go through the pandemic and all of the, the the craziness that came along with it and then somehow we've kind of out of the frying pan into the fryer we have inflation and we have rising gas prices and we have kind of this new array of challenges with the continuing impact of potentially supply chain labor shortages etc how significant do you think the current economic challenges are for malls and how significant do you expect them to be as we continue deeper into the year Oh, I think, I mean, the, the impact I don't think can be understated, and, and it's going to be one of those things that keeps us all up at night, uh, especially through the rest of this year. Um, I think the, the centers that have been able to come out of COVID and take market share from their competitors, I mean, we all know in the U.S. the, the competitive landscape of retail is, is, is tremendous, especially in major markets where, where most of our shopping centers are. Um, but those centers that have been able to take market share and, and start to see the transformation or the trend of, of sales and, and traffic increase over 19 and last year, um, they have a distinct advantage. Um, the problem for landlords is in order to take market share, you've got to put something in front of the customer that is different. Um, and in order to do that, that, that compelling offer, uh, that better place, um, the safety, the cleanliness that the customer wants today, costs a lot of money and landlords aren't, aren't as uh, full of cash as they were pre-pandemic. So it's, it's a very, very difficult challenge. That's interesting. How do you balance that need to be kind of ahead of the curve and having all the, all the elements you, you, you want to have, but not putting the cart before the horse of, hey, you know, we still have to be financially responsible here. Like they're, I mean, it's not so hard to think of properties that have this huge promise and really exciting things going on. They don't necessarily have all the visitors yet. Well, no, you're right. And, and it, you've got to be really careful and you can't do it at every project at the same time. Um, I mean, at, at Westfield, we were typically touching a couple per year. Um, we were very active in the redoing of many of our flagship properties pre-pandemic from 2017 to 2021. That has given us a distinct advantage post-COVID because our places feel good, they look good. Um, they're newer than a lot of our competitors. Um, and then what are we going to do post COVID with, you know, a little less cash in the bank? Um, our development models have, have needed to change and switch. And now we're JV partnering with, uh, with, uh, 
you know, developers, whether it's residential or office to come in and they can finance the projects and we'll, we'll have new JV partnerships going forward. So it won't cost us as much to continue to reiterate or figure out what that next iteration of our places are going to be. I think it's so interesting because I do think that next iteration piece is so important. And one of the things that got missed, when we were in the height of kind of the retail apocalypse narrative, I think like, you know, mid 2015-ish you know, and, and on, there was just a, a lack of understanding of all of the amazing steps that were being taken early and the time it takes to see those bear fruit. And I think we're going to, part of the, what we're seeing in this post-pandemic environment or post-pandemic in, in big quotations, but at least pandemic's retail impact is the value of decisions that were made years ago. I do think that indoor malls are performing better than we expected or better than most expected mm -hmm. overall and better than other similarly challenged segments because I think there's a fair argument to be made that malls should have felt more pain than some other segments when you think about COVID, the legacy of COVID, inflation, et cetera. Why do you think that relative strength has been there? And what can we learn about it for the future of top tier malls? Look, I think uh, we're, we're all pleasantly, well, pleasantly glad that the demise of the malls was overstated, right? Um, I mean, we're seeing, if you look at just our portfolio, our traffic last uh, in June, which I don't have July fully yet, but our traffic in June um, was off uh, between four and 6%, um, depending on our flagships, our regional malls, right? So we've got two tiers at Westfield. We have 23 projects, 12 flagships, 11 regionals. Our flagships are off four to six percent. Meanwhile, our regionals are off ten plus, ten to twelve. Um, there's a big difference between being off four percent and off ten percent, and it's the quality, it's the offering, and it's the investment that the landlords have put into these projects. Um, again, it's it's a struggle for us to continue to invest in the projects that can't regain the market share. And I imagine it's a struggle for every landlord and it's going to make, it's going to force us into some really tough decisions on which malls can you reinvest in, which ones are then going to survive and which ones are you unfortunately unable to continue to push forward in the manner that, that each landlord wants to. And for us, we don't want to do something unless we know we can then, we can move the needle, we can shift and be the best in the market that we're in. So we don't want to cut and paste what someone has already done. We've got to find a way to consistently over deliver on the expectations of the customers in the markets where we reside. I mean, it's 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 so interesting. It kind of does lead to this follow up of like you know you talk about that, you know even like four to six percent compared to last June, which is a very strong month when you think about especially sales wise what we were seeing in, in twenty one, especially mm -hmm. for like higher end malls where you're thinking about that luxury boom that we were in the midst of. I mean, it's fairly small could all things considered everything we're facing like what it, i mean what is it about about kind of the mall that is keeping people coming especially at those those flagships and i'd add to that how, how how why do you think malls have been so successful in in kind of maximizing their potential so even though there's less visitors less visitors in many cases they're doing more revenue mm -hmm. by providing better experiences well, yeah. So, I mean, I mentioned traffic was off, you know, four to six percent across our flagships. Meanwhile, sales are up uh, nineteen percent over twenty nineteen and twenty two percent over twenty twenty one. So, we're continuing to see our flagships, our best assets, outperform the indices you see across the entire country. So, to be off four or five percent in traffic, but be up almost twenty percent in sales, that's the power of the consumer that's coming to these places. But we also need to give credit to the retailers who have rebounded really well. Um, COVID shook out a lot of bad retail offering and landlords have lost centers and centers have gone away, but it also shook away a lot of bad retailers who were kind of just on the cycle of trying to keep stores open, but that what they were really doing was taking, you know, a, a portion of the pie away from the great retailers in that sales. Um, I mean, there are some really, really great sales success stories coming out of the pandemic. You've got brands that are creating like a lifestyle around them that are really resonating with the consumers, whether you watch what Lululemon is trying to do, not just here in the US, but globally, you look at Aritzia's dominance of women's mm -hmm. fashion coming out of COVID and their sales increases, or upstart brands, and they're not really upstarts anymore, but Travis Matthews dabbling into women's fashion now and creating more of a lifestyle beyond golf. And, uh, you know, Ali Yoga is expanding and, and seeing tremendous success. And I think Viore is 
is a, is yeah. a fun brand to watch as well as they continue to uh, create a lifestyle around who they are to their customer. You gotta, give, you gotta give the retailers some credit because because they're doing some really cool stuff. I, I mean, I agree. I also think there's something really interesting about how the consumer behavior adapts. So we have a we have a report coming early next week that's looking at Target and Walmart and what they did in in the last few months. And one of the things that we're seeing is, is traffic down, but visit durations are starting to rise the way they did early on in the pandemic. So people are spending more time with each visit. I mean, that's going to lead to increased basket size. I mean, and I think for a lot of these retailers who you know, sales rep, obviously, you know, very often margins are getting pinched and, and you know, profitability is being impacted by, by other elements. But you're right. A lot of these retailers are making very smart decisions. And there is clearly a lot of lingering demand. Mm-hmm. You know, even if, re- if sales are up in this kind of environment, that just tells you something about where the consumer's mindset is at. Well, and, and the, the relationship between the landlord and the retailer has changed a bit as well, right? I mean, landlords have always focused on getting the largest rent we've ever been possible to get guaranteed from the retailer. And there was a lot of risk on our retail partners that they had to then perform at certain levels. And it was an unknown in some cases when they entered new markets. Post COVID, you know, that relationship, it's a little bit more symbiotic where we, we, we have to obsess over the sales that our retail partners can do within our centers. And we should be incentivized for that in the lease terms that we're, we're making. Um, if we need, if we can't get the rent that we believe our spaces work, then we've got to be able to bet on the sales that are going to come out of each space within our shopping center. And then, uh, you know, when the sales show up and the people show up buying things, then the tide rises and everybody wins. I think it also incentivizes the ideal behavior because it, it, I think it pushes the, the center owner to ask, what are they doing for this overall experience? It's going to make it more beneficial for, for, for the retailers and for the consumers to kind of be there, spend time and spend. I totally agree. And it's, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it's how do we as a landlord help our brands and our retail partners better connect with their customer? And it doesn't, I mean, historically, if I was just wearing my leasing hat, all we were doing was taking a space and trying to fill it with the best brand and the best rent possible. And then that connection was up to them to, to, to formulate with their customer. I think today through the media networks that we have within our centers, through the eventing, um, you know, through online platforms, you've got so many more ways to connect with a customer and help our retailers and brands connect with the customer than before. And if you have the right place in the right atmosphere, it's a place that brands want to resonate and, and, and find a way. And, and the conversations we're having with retailers right now are really exciting. Uh, it's also the mall though has the brand. And this is one we have, a, we're, we do our big, we always do at the end of the year, our kind of trends piece. Mm-hmm. And one of them will be this year, the idea of like kind of malls, especially embracing their role as a brand. And we had this conversation with, uh, you know, with Billy Taubman talking about the Short Hills Mall, which you know near where I grew up, and you know, yes, malls make up the brand. Like you are stronger because of the great retailers that sit there. But those retailers benefit. Any retailer that now goes into the Short Hills Mall is just fancier in the eyes of everyone who lives around that area in New Jersey because they're Absolutely. in the Short Hills Mall. There is Absolutely. a there's two streets there in terms of a brand. It's not just retailers bringing something to the table. It's the malls bringing something too. Yeah, I mean, look, Short Hills isn't a, a massive fortress center like we have some in this country, and it's very well curated with a high-end luxury mix. They've done a nice job there. And you're right. If a brand gets in and is able to get a space there, it elevates that brand in the eye of the consumer. And there's a, a maybe a trust that's then formed between the customer shopping and, and, and expecting what they see when they go there and actually the validation. Um, a lot of brands pre-COVID, you know, they were trying to connect with customers through Facebook ads and things like that, but you didn't trust them because you were just seeing them in the palm of your hand. You didn't know what it felt like, what it looked like, or if it was just someone who had some ad dollars they were trying to spend. But when you can actually get them into a top tier asset, it, it, it validates them in another way and it helps them connect with the customer way beyond what they were doing before. We, we, uh, we're, absolutely. We're, we're going to get into, into digitally native brands, especially a little bit later. So I want to, I'm going to save my, my follow up for, for that. I'm going to sk- skip this one because we're already, get, we're already moving, you know, <laughs> we're, we're diving deep in. But I want to talk about kind of the, the steps you can take now to kind of make the situation better from a practical perspective. And I think there, there has been this really interesting element of like, you know, tenant mix changing in terms of what are our expectations what are our expectations in within a mall but also kind of some of the things you're mentioning events that you can run the the marketing kind of power you have within it within an asset like what are the cars that mall owners can play to drive traffic and also drive and maybe these I think these two things are related but also drive better mall experiences yep well so so for us uh, we are on a mission 
to make sure that our destinations become landmark and iconic and whatever that means in the market that they're given. So you've got Valley Fair on here, right? Bringing the first Italy to Northern California and the second in all of California helps drive, right? It's going to increase our market share. It's going to increase our, our trade area. It's increasing our dwell time and it's increasing our traffic, right? And now it becomes a must visit within our market. If we can get three, four, five of those things at every one of our assets, and, for, and depending, it doesn't matter who the landlord is, but if you're in a market and you deliver something different and special that doesn't exist anywhere else, that point of differentiation, that's how you're going to drive traffic in your given market. That's how you're going to win market share. And that's how the customer is going to trust your brand as a shopping center and start to expect high, better things going forward. And, and Italy has been... I mean, it, it, we opened up our uh, billion dollar expansion of Westfield Valley Fair about a week before COVID hit. Now, that was a terrible timing for us because the world didn't get to see what we had spent five years developing. Um, the positive that we found in that was we were a little slow on the lease up. Some of the stores weren't quite ready to open. So when we reopened, you know, six months later, whatever it was, we had a lot more stores for the customer to come and experience. And again, that was two years ago. And we're still trying to fill some of that space with the right, right partner. Italy opened up a little over two months ago, and it has transformed the expansion of, of that, that shopping center for us. And that's one that's been a major winner. I mean, just I, I, given the market, the Silicon Valley demographics, the money that exists there, the zero price sensitivity to anything we offer there. <laughs> um, if you haven't seen Westfield Valley Fair, it is the latest and best development we've done to date. I mean, it's amazing. It really does stand out to you. This is from research of going into kind of our mall white paper, which is going to be be hitting hopefully this week or next. But I mean, it, it's quite dramatic to see the impact of what some of these different tenants can bring to the table. I want to shift gears a little bit mm -hmm. to look at, at holiday. And this is obviously a graph from last year. And what we saw last year was kind of a really strong October. And then Omicron starts hitting and really has a big impact in, yep. in kind of later on in the season. What are your expectation, expectations for the retail season this winter? And what are you trying to do to tilt the odds in your favor? Look, November and December were impacted last year, right? So that gives us all that positive or that potential for positive impact at holiday that is, should help round out the numbers. I think the fluctuations in this market and trying to understand what's going to occur the next four months is what's keeping me up at night. So if, if I was to say, I, I think traffic can maintain the, the level that it's at right now um, across our port pl platforms. If we can, if we can still remain between, you know, five and 10% off 2019 through the end of the year, I think that would be a relative win. So that would keep us on the same pace we're at now. And I do think that sales will continue to increase overall. I don't think we're going to have a major dip late summer. And because of Omicron last year, we're going to get positive traffic and positive sales when we get to the holiday season this year. I mean, this is it's funny. We were just we were talking to a to a journalist about this earlier this week. We're like, don't forget that July is a really high bar to hit because of how good July was last year. Yep. August is already a much easier bar to hit because Delta was having its impact halfway through the month. And so I do think those kind of remembering what we're comparing to is such an important element because things are going to look better. And we had a our colleague uh, who, who talked about this recently. He thinks that, uh, you know, the, his, his big, bold prediction for, for the holidays is that brick and mortar was going to outperform in terms of growth e-commerce again and see a better year than e-commerce would in terms of growth. I think it makes a lot of sense, especially when you consider the challenges. And, and that is a perfect segue, Colin, because now I'd love to hear your bold prediction for a brand or segment to watch out for in this holiday season. Oh, the movies. I'm all about the movies. I love the movies. Our family goes to the movies regularly. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of nerdy in that respect. I, yeah, I know all the releases that are coming. There are some really, really big movies coming out between now and the end of the year. And I think uh, the movie theaters overall, those that are, and again, I don't want to say every single theater will outpace 2019, but you are going to see the best theaters in this country, those that have been able to take market share through closures, outperform 2019. Now, not the whole industry, but the best theaters in this country will do better than they did in 19. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And this is the, the added piece here is, you know, whatever you want to call or define as, as a recession, we like the terminology, a period of economic uncertainty. People are a little bit more concerned about where things are heading. What do they spend on though? They spend mm -hmm. on the movies because it's a cheap way to get the family out of the house, 
get a, get away, get out of your own kind of head for a little bit. Classically, with a, a sector that does very well during periods of economic uncertainty, and it didn't obviously in COVID because of what we said. The big question for me though is, are they going to take that next step forward? Because there's some really cool theater brands where you go in and it's and it's an, it's an experience to be in the theater, and then there's mm-hmm. others that are. If you're just chairs, popcorn, and a larger screen, I, I think you're going to be, I don't know that this is going to be a miracle cure. It's a great question. I think there's there's so much unused space and time within the movie theaters. They've got to figure out a way to monetize their, their places uh, beyond just watching movies. It's not easy to do, and it's not easy to do in suburban America where most of the theaters reside. Um, I don't know what that answer is going to be, but I can tell you, I mean, we just opened a brand new AMC. It's the newest theater in the country at Westfield Topanga uh, here in LA. They relocated a a very high performing theater, but reopened it up about half as many screens. They did an amazing job. And the experience of going in there with the restaurant and the bar and the ability to enjoy, you know, what you would like to prior to going and seeing the movie, it does go beyond just that prototypical, let's just go see a movie and eat some popcorn. We have some really good theaters that need to continue to upgrade. Um, that's expensive. And if the theaters don't see the sales come back at the end of the year, you're going to see a lot more of that kind of haves and have nots like we are in the mall sector across the, the theaters as well. And I don't think we've seen the end of the closures in the theaters because there are a lot of them. And the consolidation isn't over in that sector. But the, the really good ones, um, I think are going to shine at the end of the year. Also, there's so much upside content wise. For whatever reason, we've recognized content distribution you can watch i mean amazon buys the rights to like nfl games uh-huh. but we haven't theaters haven't figured out how to leverage again like you said quiet times where they have these massive screens and stadium seating to show me other things like that's that's the breakthrough i really want to see and I, you know it's obviously i think it's coming but it'll be interesting to see who who leads that that charge we should, we should we should get some friends together when the world cup comes and rent out some theaters and watch the games right what a better way to, to get together that could be a lot of fun uh, i mean it, yes absolutely like I, you know i i grew, i went to school during i did my undergrad during the world cup and there was all of the kids from spain in the school that year spain won and to be part of those watching those games with them was was amazing and so oh yeah you know, you're watching at some random sports bar, which is wonderful. Theaters have a better offering there. Well, and to watch the and to watch it with you know people from all over the globe, the way that they watch soccer is different than we watch it here. But yeah, I do think exactly. over the next 24 months, soccer is going to continue to take off in this country and become bigger and bigger. It's a big opportunity for that sport. We were watching uh, some colleagues were and I were watching the Real Madrid uh, Man City game, but we were with the the Spaniards when it happened and when they won that game I mean it was just insane watching watching them celebrate compared to how we celebrate sports you, know you don't even need to go go soccer like I grew I'm, I'm a diehard Miami Dolphins fan and I grew up in New Jersey which is not a pleasant place to grow up as a Dolphins fan if there had been a theater that gathered together locals to watch the games together I would have been there every Sunday it, it, no. I, I just think there is a a lack I don't know if it's maybe it's lack of access or a lack of creativity with content and if they can figure that out it's going to be really really interesting I want to get into some bigger questions, and I want to start with one that is maybe the most popular question we've been getting over the last month, month and a half, and it's about luxury. So luxury was one of the big retail winners. Yep. And we, you know, different even when visits were down, people were spending more. There was kind of uh, government stimulus. We talked about the value of resale markets, kind of changing the true cost of of these items. But it does feel like this wave is starting to kind of taper off. How do you contextualize the luxury segment's performance over kind of the last year? And where do you expect it to go in the coming months? Well, I mean, I think we're all happy, especially where we have luxury in our centers, that they've been having 30, 40, 50 percent compound increases for multiple years in a row. Tapering off is probably the right word for it. Um, In June, we started for the first time to see some sales dip into the red um, from prior year, but you're still up 50, 70% over where they were in 2019. And the sales volumes you're seeing from some of these luxury brands are just, they're they're just obscene. If you look at your graph here, I mean, it almost correlates with the restrictions being lifted uh, Mm -hmm. last year, right? January, February, even March, we still had heavy restrictions on the West Coast, especially in California. And that was why April, May, June started to ramp up so much. Here you're seeing it ramp down 
But at the same time, um, the sales aren't ramping down as much as people are thinking. At least, you know, Louis Vuitton, Tiffany are still seeing sales grow through June and into July. I think some of the other brands that are expanding, the Gucci's, the St. Laurent's, they are tapering off a bit. You're not seeing the 30% increases. But I think they're still underpenetrated here in the U.S. compared to other parts of the world, Asia, Europe, with a number of stores. And for them, it's market share, and they're going to continue to open stores and take market share um, in those places that are right for them. And, and adding luxury to an asset obviously helps pave the way for market dominance for another decade or two. So where the landlords can bring it in, it, it, it helps you and it elevates your asset for years to come. It's, it's so interesting because it's, it's not just short term. And I, it does feel like what's, what's fascinating about the resale market is that it's offered a, a window into something that was unaccessible to many audiences. So you think about you know, the cost that millennials are paying on, on housing and the like and, and what that does to, you know, does it create the same, you know, value around luxury? But the resale market changes that. It makes it accessible, especially high end. I think that's super exciting for this for this sector, and it's going to give it a, a long. And remember, from and before we pull off of that, I mean, luxury is less worried about traffic; they're more worried about catering to their core consumer, right? So they want to be they want to be there, and yes, they want that that core customer to come back as frequently as often. That it's not a quarterly visit; they'd like them to come once or twice a month. Um, but it's that core customer that they're catering towards, which is why you still see doors closed, and they're still doing clientele with appointment only. Um, and we've had requests from luxury brands to only operate six. And in some cases, they only want to be forced to have to operate five days a week because they think they can better serve their client with their best salespeople in five days. That's a tough proposition for a landlord to swallow because now you're thinking customers' expectations, when they show up, who's going to be open. It's going to be, it's going to be tough uh, for us to get through that if, if we end up in that world. But um, they're really worried about giving their core customer what they want. And, uh, and, and they're less worried about the amount of traffic flowing into their doors. Yeah, I love the idea of appointment shopping, especially in luxury, but I like it in so many other sectors too. Electronics, everything related, everything we're having someone be there for you a little bit helps make the products more accessible and more exciting. Like, I, I think it's, it's such a brilliant strategy. I love the, the Chanel appointment only store. I love it. I think it's such a brilliant idea. And, well, uh, it clearly yeah. doesn't impact their sales having less people come through their door because they're actually getting those people in there and they're buying more, a lot more. Because you can focus on them and take them through the tailored experience they're looking for. It's not about yeah. not. Yeah, I think it's I think it's it's brilliant. And there are there are ways to bring that to less luxurious segments. Mm -hmm. It just has to be done tactically. I mean, look, Gucci just opened up in Columbus, Ohio. I think everyone probably saw that, right? The Gucci opened up. <laughs> at Easton Town Center. Um, that's a big deal for Ohio, right? And, and a big deal for Easton. And it's certainly going to continue to push that asset into another realm as they continue to, uh, to, to redefine who they are over the coming years. Yeah, absolutely. A another segment that we get a, a ton of questions about, and also it's kind of been, you know, went from kind of darling of the, of the retail media to maybe punching bag of the retail media recently is the digitally native brands. And I think with the recent challenges that some of these larger digitally native brands have seen. Do you expect the move of so, of like there was this very clear wave of brands coming offline. Do you think that some of these late, you know, recent headlines is gonna start impacting that wave and we'll see less? Well, look, I think it was a, a big focus of our sales teams to figure out who those brands were gonna be. How do we partner with them and how do we open them up? Because the newness of a brand we thought was going to raise sales and attract more customers. I mean, it, it's played out a little bit. And what we found is if the brand doesn't have a resonating customer base that's living in that market and already buying it, it's not going to be successful just because we put it in to our shopping centers. Um, look, you've got Allbirds on here. We've got a number of Allbirds stores that are open and they perform. They perform at a good, consistent level. I don't think they perform at what we thought they'd perform three years ago when we first started opening those stores. But if you told me that you've got a, and by the way, they're turning into a lifestyle brand, right? They've got clothes in there. They go beyond the shoes. And, and as they continue to iter reiterate this lifestyle or this culture that you can associate with the brand, I think that's where you're going to see uh, the separation of the digitally natives that can be successful and those that might just kind of be a flash in the pan. If Allbirds had only stuck to just selling a shoe in a couple different you know, variations, I don't think they would be able to see the growth long-term that I, I have the hopes they'll be able to see. Because there's a culture behind that brand now and a customer can resonate with that a, a bit. That's, it's such a good point. We talk about this a lot, the idea of kind of what you're calling like the lifestyle, lifestyle you know, 
uh, this idea of like the store as a platform. So you have this kind of core element that you bring to market that people know you for, and that's your initial lure. But over time, you're able to go to these different levels. Like think of a Warby, we always said as, you know, this is a random thinking was like, if I sell glasses, how crazy is it if I sell visors? Mm -hmm. How crazy is it if I sell hats or other kind of, you know, headwear? Like there are, there is a lot of room to make, you know, one degree of separation moves that widen what you can sell. And I think that's something, part of the reason that a lot of these brands want physical locations is you can't do that online. Discovery does not happen online the same way it happens in a physical store. Mm -hmm. So yes, if once you have those, those, those kind of roots in the ground, you have the ability to kind of take customers on this journey away from those core products. Mm -hmm. Uh, look, I would agree. Um, I was recently in Chicago and I saw a parachute store that opened up at, at Oak Brook. And it was a little smaller than the one that resides in Brooklyn, but you go into those stores and it's not just bedding and sheets and towels, right? You, I mean, it's a li little bit more of a, of a lifestyle of what you want your home to look and feel like. And, and you can start to resonate with what the brand's trying to do going beyond what they might've just started selling online. Um, and I think that evolution these brands are finding is is going to help make them successful and if it's just you're selling one product or one set of shoes it might be best to go the wholesale route and figure out a way to get into better bigger you know opportunities to sell whether it's the nordstrom's of the world or something like that yeah. so speaking i mean speaking of of that wholesale or that that place in between wholesale and kind of owning like several locations or many locations how big of a role do you expect pop-ups to play in major malls in the coming years thinking about brands like this and others who want to have that whether it's a larger brand who wants to be in more markets at specific times of the year, a smaller brand who wants to see what retail means for them, what, what role do you expect from, from pop-ups? I think it's a huge opportunity, right? I mean, depending upon the brand and, and the climate, depending, you know, if you're, if you're a, a warm weather brand or a cold weather brand popping into a place like LA versus the Northeast makes a big difference. And instead of spending hundreds of thousands, if not a million dollars building out a store, you can pop up and see what you resonate with a customer. The good news is through people like Placer and, and other technology companies, these brands have more information when they want to plant a flag than they ever have before. So it helps them make a much better educated guess of what success might look like when they land um, versus kind of throwing that dart on the board, which you may have been doing five, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But we still, we, should, we in, in all of our best assets, we're looking to pop stores up and whether that's three months, six months, 12 months, um, and what I'm finding is some of these pop-up stores, they, they don't look so bad. They don't look like pop-ups in many cases. Uh, we just did a pop-up with Louis Vuitton at UTC. I mean, the space looks amazing and, uh, it might be there for a couple of years, which is good news, but, uh, it's, it's crazy what these store designers can do with a little bit of, uh, ingenuity and a little bit of money on these pop-ups, but we'll, I yeah. think we'll, we'll keep them coming. Um, and it allows that kind of sense of exploration for the customer as well. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's excitement. I also think it's, I think one of the things you want to see from digitally native brands is how do you keep your personality when you come offline? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, you know, I, I have like, I think of like the, my, my latest digitally native kind of obsession is true, true classic. They make like the t-shirts mm -hmm. like for, and they, their whole personality online is it's funny. It's really oriented towards their target market. How do you, if you're going to do a pop-up or you're going to do an online store, how do you keep that? as you're rolling into that next stage, because that's what's going to make the consumer excited. They're like, oh, th this is the brand I knew. Yep. Well, and I think that you've seen that from the brands, right? Because they don't choose to pop up in shopping centers. Typically, they'll pop up on a street mm -hmm. that more resonates who they are as a culture and a personality. And that's the challenge for landlords and developers. Can you create a place that a brand sees their brand fitting in? Um, but if you've got four department stores fully enclosed and there's nothing externalized, chances of getting a really cool brand to come pop up in your mall, they're very slim. It just, uh, it doesn't resonate with who they are or who they want to be. It's also why you see a lot of those brands, you know, they'll open up on the top 40 streets in America before they'll do their first quote unquote mall store. But I think the definition of what a mall is today has changed substantially. So, um, but it, oh, it, it, so. It, it, it's what, it's what, I mean, that's what the challenge of being a good landlord is. And developer, how do we continue to change what our offering is so that we can attract a brand that has a, a core customer culture or personality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of speaking of department stores, you know, the wider narrative has obviously not been incredibly positive in recent years, yet it does feel like this segment is starting to really show some serious strength and signs of life. What should we expect from department stores as a wider segment moving forward? 
Macy's is doing an incredible business this year. I don't know how much you're tracking it, but yeah. um, shocked at what Macy's has been able to do. And I think it's the part through consolidation, part through some revised efforts and some collaborations within their stores and they're using their space better. Um, I mentioned Valley Fair earlier, the Bloomingdale store that they built there, the brand new one is absolutely stunning and, and out of this world and, and the way that they're actually presenting their product from luxury all the way down through um, the contemporary brands is spectacular. Um, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that department stores are not going away. Although as a landlord, we do plan for a future where there might not be department stores in some of the assets. And we have to prepare for that because the, I mean, we're fortunate. We're a much smaller company than we used to be. We've got 23 assets here in the US. You know, we don't, we very less than a handful of JC pennies. Um, we don't have any Sears um, clearly. And if you've got a Nordstrom's and a Macy's and 150 stores and you've got opportunity to, to, to develop and densify that land, that to me is, is a huge opportunity. I honestly think they're getting smarter about where they're locating. When we were, we've, we felt really strong about Macy's for a few years now. And one of the things we kept on saying is they're innovating, they're trying things. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't nail it the first time, that doesn't mean you're not going to nail it over time. And I think give smart companies a kind of an innovation streak where they're trying things and I feel really good about where they're going to get and you know like our our most recent kind of bold one was like we feel better about Kohl's gravity Kohl's not really a mall yeah. asset but mm -hmm. like I think I think people are getting way too caught up about Kohl's but look at look at the decisions they're making they're all in line with where retail is heading they make sense it, they have a really strong brand we all know who they are no one's like oh I've never heard of them that's yeah. a nice thing to walk into the into the mix with. I agree. Um, and I was I was just in uh, DC yesterday, and I got a chance to go. Uh, I had been there before, but to the Bloomy store, the small footprint Bloomies that they opened up at the Mosaic Project uh, in Virginia. What did and you think of it? Really nice. I, I mean, I've been there three or four times, and every time I walk in, they've elevated it beyond from where the prior visit was. And now we, um, we're actually building the second one. It'll be at Old Orchard in, in outside of Chicago. Wow. It'll be 50,000 feet versus 25 or 30. Um, but a huge opportunity for that brand to put something to ground that's absolutely amazing. So uh, I love what they're doing. And I think that smaller footprint, you know, curated selection of what the customer truly wants versus having to fill 250,000 square feet with stuff that nobody touches is a really great way for them to continue to look to, to build their business going forward. That's so smart. We I love the blooming the blooming's idea. I think it's a different experience, and it, mm -hmm. it just gives you as a retailer the ability to look at an asset that you want to be in and say, "What's the right way for me to approach this market? Mm -hmm. Is it in a high street? Is it in a mall? Is it in?" And if you the more format flexibility you have, the more options you're going to have. I think it's brilliant. I really really love that idea too. I mean, speaking of Bloomies, what are one of the things that I've always kind of loved about our conversations is you tend to be pretty keen on, you have a very good sense of kind of where retail is going in terms of the types of tenants that I think everyone's going to get excited about. Everyone's going to be talking about a year later. You seem to be far ahead of the curve. What are, what are the really important tenant types? And I've done just random examples, but what are the tenant types that you're looking at as being really significant in the mall environment moving forward? Well, I touched on it a couple of times, but I think the brands that have that lifestyle or culture attached to them, because they've got a core customer that's going to come looking for them. Um, I challenge the sales teams all the time. If you see people standing in line for something, we want that in our shopping center, because that means people are willing to spend their time, their commodity, waiting for something. And that, that just long, that, that furthers the amount of time that they'll be in our shopping center. Um, a big metric for us also, Ethan, and we talked about this, I think, on a prior one of these, but is... How many stores does our customer visit every time they come to one of our places, right? And if we're not measuring that metric as landlords, then I think we're doing ourselves a disservice because then we're really just filling space without a plan. But if you've got every customer coming to 2.2 shops every time they come, how do you get it to 2.5 or to three? It's by giving them what they want. Um, I mean, I've mentioned some of some of the brands that I think are doing a tremendous job. I think Travis Matthew, Viore, I think Lulu, somehow Lululemon continues to amaze me. They're getting bigger stores. They have more stores than ever yet. They're still continuing to drive their business and innovate through product and design. Um, the athleisure brands are, are doing a nice job. I think I think some some legacy brands here in the U.S. and legacy just because they've been around a while, but like like Levi's and Nike and their attempt to take back control of their brand 
it's really interesting to watch. I think Levi's push to open up all these stores and control their identity with the customer is huge. And they've done a really nice job. We've been fortunate to partner with them a couple of times. And Nike's made it known their intentions to kind of control their brand through rolling out a couple hundred stores. I don't know if they'll, they'll get to it. Um, it's going to be challenging, but at least they're trying because they know if they own their brand in a better way versus letting the department stores or other wholesalers control how their brand is offered to the consumer, they have a much better chance of, of, of surviving long-term. Yeah, they're also, you think how much they're investing in that brand. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it makes a lot of sense. A question came in, what is your position on retailtainment? Well, look, I think it's, a, it's an interesting term. Um, experiential, right? That's the way I kind of look at it. You've got to be able to go beyond shopping as a landlord. What does that mean? There are so many concepts out there wanting to do something. The problem is they're 30, 40, 50,000 square feet a lot of times, and they cost millions of dollars to put to ground. They haven't all been proven out. And as a landlord with limited capital compared to pre-COVID times, you've got, those are big bets you're making. Um, we partnered with Kingsman and we're doing uh, Nerf and Planet Play School, two really big uh, uh, options at Garden State Plaza, which is gonna be amazing. Um, I think that that kind of thing you have to have because you have to differentiate yourselves from others and you've got to give reasons for the people to come that go beyond shopping. Um, I, I was just at Oak Brook in Chicago. I think they're doing the Sony Wonderverse deal in the old Kidzania space. It'll be interesting to see. I hope that's successful. It's a big gamble, a big bet, a lot of square footage. But those are the types of things that as a landlord, if you've got a lot of space, you've got to find a way to put something in. Putt Shack, I think, is doing an incredible job. I was in one of their new units. Um, and their sales volumes are driving their ability to, you know, pull traffic in. Um, I've been to the swingers as well. So that, that just the whole, the whole, you know, putt putt concept, I think is something that's interesting. I just get nervous. It's expensive. It takes up a lot of space. And if you make a bad decision, it, it's going to cost you. That's interesting. I also think we, we kind of underplay the, exp I mean, retail team, I think is a really interesting term. It's not one I've heard, heard often, but I mean, the experience of like, I mean, walking into a high-end luxury store and they put out kind of that leather mat and they put all the items on it. That mm -hmm. is that is a form of entertainment. That is experiential retail. Like, I think, yes, those big kind of eye-catching entities are, are really exciting, but so is kind of the core of the experience. Um, another question came in, what are your thoughts and trends on uh, medical and wellness retail? And are they associated with luxury brands? Uh Yes and yes, because I actually think uh, being fit, perceived as being fit, having good health is luxury in today's environment. Um, so yes, uh, absolutely. I think uh, all of our shopping centers in this country have too much retail, too much fashion, square footage dedicated to them, and we've got to peel that back. Um, it'll allow those that are really good, more of the, you know, their share of the pie to increase sales while we, you know, diversify the offer of our, our, our mix. Um, We've got, we've got great partnerships here in LA with UCLA Medical Group, where we actually have medical clinics in our shopping centers, OneMed, uh, Forward, Next Health. These are all really cool, innovative health concepts that differ in a varying degree across the spectrum. Uh, kind Body, which is a women's fertility clinic here in LA, we've now done a couple of deals with. Um, very cool uses, and these are in high-end shopping places where people don't feel like um, it's out of place. Uh, so yes, I love the uses. And I think any reason that you can put down to ground that gives the consumer um, the requirement to come to your places more often is a win. That's such a great point. And, and with that, Colin, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining us. Your insights are always so appreciated. And it's always so much fun to have these conversations. Thank you for being here. Uh, Ethan, thank you. And, and we love the, the place of products. We love working with you guys. You're helping us innovate. And um, for those on the call that aren't working closely with you guys, you need to uh, figure it out because it's a, it's a game changer for us. And we are grateful that you guys exist. Thank you, Colin. And, uh, and everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it as always. Uh, we're going to have a slight uh, a gap before our next one of these, which will be in early September to look at back to school. But uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Colin, again. And everyone have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye, guys.